Okay. Uh, hey everyone, welcome to our talk, Rogue No More, Securing Kubernetes with Non-Specific Restrictions. Um, yeah, um, yeah, thanks for coming. I'm James Monley. I'm a uh, software engineer in the open engineering um, department at Apple. And I'm Anish. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft working on security. I am a member of Kubernetes SIGOT and maintainer for Secrets Row CSI driver. Yeah, so I guess a bit of background on um, kind of this whole problem space. So in Kubernetes, uh, like you're probably already aware, nodes have a required set of permissions. They need to interact with different resources. They need to um, you know, take actions and they go and create, make changes on the node that they're running um, accordingly. So the one thing that we haven't really got a good solution for or we haven't um, really thought much about is you know, what stops one node modifying another node's objects. So, the Kubernetes project did recognize this um, a few years back. Uh, well, sorry, I should jump in. The Kubert um, has got to manage all of these different objects. So you've got pods, nodes, persistent volume claims, and this is kind of all through the life cycle of starting up your workload. So um, included in there, although not listed on here, is things like secrets, config maps, very sensitive information. Um, additionally, like if you think about it, if one node could go and modify another, this is a really good attack vector for one um, for one, uh, for, for an attacker to kind of get from a node that they've managed to break into into a more secure place. You might have different like taints, tolerations and things to only run your really super sensitive uh, workloads only on your specific node pool, but via the API server you could traverse, get onto the next node, onto the next node, until you're kind of getting yourself a cluster admin super privileged uh, token, which is not great. So this was recognized a while back um, and the Kubelet has actually already got a solution for parts of this, um, and that's in the node restriction admission plugin. Has anyone heard of that before? Yeah, a few, okay. Um, so yeah, this, this uh, admission plugin actually restricts nodes so that they can only modify or access uh, resources that are relevant to them. So by relevant here, I mean um, like if the pod that, well, if you're trying to access a secret, then must be a pod scheduled to that node that, uh, that actually references that secret. And that stops you just being able to kind of go off and grab a random thing. This wasn't always the case for a while. You know, Kubelets could just go and grab any old secret from the thing. And then suddenly you think about it, unless you've got really hardened security on your node, it's a bit of a scary thing. And even if you do have hardened security, you probably want to be careful beyond just basics. So um, this works by inspecting the username, the groups, um, on the node's identity and cross-referencing that to then go and look up and uh, like maintaining a map of the pods and things like that to know what's relevant. Um, and if it's not, it rejects the request. But what about daemon sets? Like Kubelet's one thing, but you probably all run a CNI that may well run as a daemon set. Uh, you might run CSI drivers. You might run whatever else you run. And these also all have permissions, and they may need to interact with uh, the API server, store some state, grab configuration, grab credentials. Uh, and all of these, you know, this is a risk. Um, you're running this across your whole fleet, um, and you can kind of traverse around if you're not careful. Um, yeah, so we don't, well, there hasn't been a solution for doing this with daemon sets up until now. The node restriction plugin is not generalized. Uh, it specifically looks for node objects. And it works with node identities, so system colon node colon something. Um, as I say, that means you can move between, well, with a suitably a suitable set of chained attacks, you can actually go and move between different nodes on the cluster uh, and start to escalate your privileges. And there are examples of this. Okay. Well. So we talked about the problems with daemon set, right? And then this particular slide is, uh, covers a critical issue that was in KubeWord. Um, and KubeWord on a high level has four components. One is the handler, uh, then a controller, and then API and an operator. Each of these components has specific permissions that function, but also create security risks if a single node is compromised. So the KubeWord handler is a daemon set on every single node, which has RBAC permissions to patch any node. And then the KubeWord controller has permissions to evict workloads. And then the KubeWord API pod has delete permissions on pods. And then finally, the KubeWord operator um, has permissions 
to get list and create secrets. Um, and then so if you carefully orchestrate a attack from a compromised node, you can basically make all the nodes unschedulable except the compromised node. And then you could use the RBAC permissions from the pod that has permissions to delete pods and then force the operator pod to land on the compromised node. Then using that operator pod, you can actually do privilege escalation. So you can actually become a cluster admin and that is something that we'll also show as part of the demo. Um, this is another CVE with a different project, um, Fluid, uh, which basically has a CSI driver. So it has a CSI node plugin, Fluid pod, uh, that can exploit service account to modify node specs for other nodes. Uh, this basically can do the same thing. It can set other pods to non-schedulable and then try and move privileged pods from the other nodes to the compromised node. And then once it does that, basically it can use the permissions of that compromised pod and then escalate all the way to become a cluster admin. So yeah, um, well, we wanted to extend kind of the permissions and the restrictions that we have from the kubelet to be able to make this more general. Um, and so we, we looked into, well, what Kep was put together, Kep 4193, uh, to improve service account tokens uh, to allow us to start doing this kind of matching. So um, service account tokens is how the majority of your workloads, like these daemon sets, are going to authenticate to your API server. Um, and they, uh, if, yeah. In KEP4193, we basically, instead of just binding pods, uh, sorry, binding your uh, token to the pod, which embeds then the pod's name, um, we're also going to bind, uh, sorry, we also now embed the node that the pod is scheduled to into that service account token. Additionally, in this cap, it had a few different angles to it. Uh, we are also extending like the binding capabilities that you can bind directly to nodes, and that's not something we're going to demonstrate here today. But um, you know, this this also allows us to bind the lifetime of a token to the lifetime of a node. So if the node object goes away, the token's invalidated. Similar to how if a pod is deleted, when you're bound to it, uh, the token's invalidated, and the API server will no longer accept it. Um, additionally, we also added the extra JTI, which is like a unique identifier for each individual instance of a JWT assigned token. Uh, we embed a new JTI into each token too, and that's actually then recorded into the Kubernetes audit log as a credential identifier. Um, not all authentication plugins support credential identifiers just yet. You know, we need to have a think about how we model this in um, like MTLS or whatever else, whatever other plugin you've got. Uh, so it's effectively optional for now, um, but service account tokens and JWTs uh, do have this concept, a JTI, which we map to the new credential identifier concept. So digging into that first one, this is kind of what it looks like. So on the left here, you can see we've got, um, I don't know how many people have decoded a service account token and looked at this before, um, but you can see we've actually got our private claims section here, uh, kubernetes.io private claims. So the actual uh, pod that we're bound to is normally embedded here as just a pod and the service account as well. And the API server uses that to understand like when a request comes in, it checks to make sure this particular pod still exists with this particular UID because pod, like objects can be deleted and recreated with the same name. Um, and that's you know, worked up until now. But so that we can actually do matching to understand where this pod runs so that we can then later use that information during admission to actually perform additional validation. Um, the API server, when it's minting these tokens, now also embeds the node name that the pod's scheduled to. So that's taken from kind of the spec.node name on the pod, but because it's actually embedded in the JWT, cryptographically signed, then passed along to the API server, we can actually use this and rely on it for like further authorization decisions. And that allows us to kind of help mitigate some of these CVEs that we've seen because it prevents one token being valid for use against any of the objects related to other nodes in a similar manner to the node restriction plugin. In fact, we're even using this change here to generalize how the node restriction plugin is implemented too. So it's kind of standardizing on some of these patterns instead of special casing certain types of identities. Um, yeah, if you want to read up more on the full cap, um, it's 4193, I've got the link here. Um, and yeah, we're now going to show how you can kind of chain this together. Well, okay. So we looked at the cap, uh, which is a good first step for us to impose restrictions on what a particular node can do. Uh, that combined with validating admission policies. 
So what is validating admission policies? Uh, validating admission policies are designed to be good alternatives for validating webhooks for most common use cases. Um, unlike webhooks, which require you to run an external service, um, these policies are actually handled within the Kubernetes API server, making them more efficient and easier to manage. Since they run in the Kube API server, they avoid the need for external network calls, which means lower latency and more reliable policy enforcement as they are evaluated natively. And then validating uh, admission policies uh, use cell to declare the validation rules for a policy. So this is an example of a validation admission policy that we'll be using in the demo. Uh, this is basically designed to restrict update operations on nodes to a specific service account uh, and ensure those updates are node specific. Um, so let's break it down. Uh, the failure policy is set to fail. That means it's fail close, meaning any policy violations will block the operation. And then it applies to, within the match constraints, you can see it's applying to a subset of operations. So any operation that's trying to update nodes basically says, okay, this matches this policy, we will go down the route, right? But in addition to match constraints, there is also another thing, match conditions, which checks if the user that we are trying to restrict is the one that's making this request. Only then we want to go and evaluate the policy. So the is restricted user is basically checking the username, which is part of the user info, and it's checking for this particular service account, which is what we're using in the demo. So it's running in default namespace, and it's called node patcher SA. And once the match constraints and match conditions are satisfied, basically it says, okay, this policy needs to be evaluated for this particular operation. And then we define a bunch of variables. Uh, the first thing is we get the user node name. So variables are defined so that you can easily reuse them in your validation expressions. Uh, so the user node name extracts the node name from the service account's user info. And this is possible because of the cap that James talked about. And then the next thing is we have the object node name that we get from the object that is being updated. So that's the node that's being updated. So we can see what the name of the object that's being updated is. And then the next step is we have a bunch of validations that we want to do. The first thing is we want to reject requests that do not have a user node name. Uh, this is possible if someone is making a request outside of the node, and we don't want to allow those requests to modify the set of pods. So that's the first expression. And then the second expression basically checks the person who is modifying. So the node object that's trying to modify another node object, both the node objects are the same. So basically you're imposing that you are only allowed to modify yourself and no one else. So this is what the user info looks like. Uh, basically this gets populated as part of authenticating. And after that, this user info and the extra fields are available for authorization as well as for admission. Um, so I've gotten this output using kubectl auth, who am I? Um, and if you see there, the, user in, uh, the username is the name of the service account that's trying to make the request. Um, and then in the extra, you can see that there is a new credential ID. So that's the JTI that James talked about. And then we also have the node name and the node UID as additional info which was previously not present. Uh, previously, we only had like the pod name and the pod UID. Okay, so let's switch to demo. Um, so it's a simple setup. I have a kind cluster that's running two worker nodes and I have three components, um, all fictitious components, not using it from any project. But basically I have a daemon set that has permissions to patch a node, which is running on every single node. Uh, then I have an API pod that has permissions to delete pods across the cluster. And then I have one secret operator which has permissions to get, list, and create secrets. And these are all RBAC permissions those components need for a specific use case, right? Um, so I am going to say the kind worker to node is the compromised node. So what we're going to do is exec into that particular node. So once we are on that node, basically what we're going to do is exec into the, so basically these are the list of containers that's running in that particular node. And as you can see, there is a daemon set pod that's running in, in that, right? So I am going to exec into that daemon set. So. 
Okay, so I'm inside the daemon set, and then this daemon set has permissions to patch any nodes. So what I'm going to do is run a kubectl command and say, I'm running on kind worker too. I'm just going to patch kind worker and make it unschedulable as a first time. So the operation succeeds because I just have patch permissions across the entire cluster. And then if I do kubectl get nodes, you can see that kind worker scheduling has been dis uh, disabled for that particular node. Uh, and then the next thing that we're going to do is I have an API pod that has delete permissions also running on this node. So I'm going to get into that. Okay, so I'm inside that pod which can delete any pod. So what I'm going to do is using that permission, I'm going to delete the secret operator pod that is running on the other node, which is not compromised, because I want to force it to land on my compromised node. Damn it. OK. So I'm going to delete that pod. And then if we now go look. Uh, okay, so if you see now, the secret operator was initially running in kind worker. Now it's been moved to my compromise node, the rogue node. So I basically have all the pods that I want, right? So the next thing I'm going to do is get into my operator node. Let's quickly get this one. So the secret operator is here. So I'm going to exec into that. Okay, so this secret operator pod has permissions to get, list, and create secrets. Um, so what I'm going to do with that is, before I do anything, I'm going to check what the permissions are, right? So I'm going to see, hey, I am a secret operator prod. Can I create pods? No. So that means we know that right now the RBAC permissions is it can only get, list, and create secrets and can do nothing more, right? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create this special Kubernetes secret. Uh, so I'm creating this secret, which is of type service account token, and I'm creating this in the cube system namespace. And if you look at it, I am using a specific service account for this one, which is the cluster role aggregation controller. Uh, the reason I'm using this is this service account in the cube system namespace actually has permissions to escalate, which means I can use those permissions to modify the cluster role for any, uh, I can modify any cluster role, and basically I can elevate my cluster role to become cluster admin. So once I do this, basically what happens is the controller is going to populate that Kubernetes secret that I just created with a token. So, so if you look at this, basically there is a token field, there is CA cert and everything that we need, but the token is the only thing that I really care about because I'm going to use that for modifying the cluster role. So let's put the token in a variable. Okay, and then let's check it's there. Okay, so I have a token. And the next thing I'm going to do is within my pod, within my secret manager pod, I'm going to go and edit my own cluster role. So this edit should, wouldn't have worked normally, but because I was able to get a token for the cluster role aggregator controller, I can actually now edit it. And all I have to do is go in, basically say any API groups, any resource, and any verb. So that's it. I can be a cluster admin. So I've edited that, and then now basically we can run the same auth command now to check if I can still, let's see. Okay, so if I now do kubectl auth, can I create pods? Yes, I can do it. Delete pods, yeah, I can do that too. And then if I want to create cluster role, yeah, I can do that as well. So that means 
basically, I started off with a compromised node, moved all the way, moved all the pods to my node, and then I was able to become a cluster admin, right? So now that we've seen the vulnerability in action, it's clear that the issue started because a node was able to update other nodes. While there are other components that are part of the demo that can be constrained more, I think in this demo, we'll focus specifically on limiting the operations that a node can do, right? And I already have the feature flags and everything enabled for uh, the feature gate that James was talking about. Also, it's in beta, so it's enabled by default. So the next thing I'm going to do is deploy a validating admission policy. So this is the same policy that we looked at before, which has which is going to try and restrict that a node can only update objects that belong to the same node. So I'm going to apply the WAP so that we've done that. And then the next thing we have to do is for a validating admission policy to take effect, you also have to apply a binding. And in the binding, in validation actions, you can actually choose if you want to deny the request, you want to warn, or you want to audit. So in this case, I've set it to warn just so we can see if the validating admission policy is working as expected before we actually start imposing the restriction. So I am going to apply the binding. Okay. So we're still on the rogue node, um, and I'm still inside the daemon set pod here. Let's try to patch. So this time, when I try to patch, I get a warning saying validation failed for this validating admission policy. You are trying to update a node that doesn't belong to you. So this is a warning. So let's change it to deny. And then let me now update the binding. OK, so now we're still on the rogue node. We're still on the daemon set. And now if I try to patch, my um, request doesn't go through because the validating admission policy says, hey, you are kind worker too. You are not allowed to modify kind worker and your request is denied. Uh, okay. So that was a demo showcasing everything that we talked about, all the caps uh, that have gone in, the validating admission policy, which is available, how you can basically compromise a single node and get all the way to a cluster admin and what are ways to prevent that for daemon sets. Um, so in terms of follow-ups, uh, we are working on enhancing, uh, adding more restrictions in Kubelet. Maybe this will also be relevant for daemon sets in the future. But the first thing that we are doing is we, in this 132 release, we added a restriction for what audiences Kubelet can request a token for. Uh, previously, Kubelet could just arbitrarily request for any audience saying, hey, I want for a particular pod. But now the node restriction admission plugin will actually check that the audience that Kubelet is requesting a token for belongs in the pods API spec. So this could be in CSR driver tokens or like projected volume sources. Uh, and then in the future, we can even expand it to have like additional audiences that the user can configure on the Kube API server. And in addition to that, we are also working on a cap to basically send service, projected service account tokens to Kubelet image credential providers. So we are trying to introduce that so that the credential providers can use service accounts for workload identity flows and basically pull images using the identity that's associated with the pod for which the image is being pulled, rather than just doing it for like an entire registry or for like a, a particular image. Um, but other than that, um, a similar talk was given. So David Eads and Joe Betts uh, gave a maintainer update and for the SIG API machinery for all the work that has gone in. Uh, in this talk, we focused specifically on the right aspect of it, but in the API machinery talk, they also talked about how you can prevent trampoline reads. But uh, yeah, that's it. Have we got any questions? I think we've got a bit of time. Uh, there's a couple of mics here as well. It looks like we got all the information we needed in there. <laughs> oh. So quite often the Kubelet will integrate with cloud provider resources like say ENIs. Are there any plans to extend this access control policy to non-Kubernetes resources? 
To, to what, sorry? Uh, Non-Kubernetes, like cloud provider resources. Uh, so I think, like these projected service count tokens, um, you can choose like your uh, audience on there. So I think it is, isn't it? You could you can pass these along to external systems then because they've got a different audience scope, and you can certainly then use that node name information and cross-reference that with anything else. Yeah, I think like um, you, yeah. So you can make authorization decisions based on this absolutely, and that that's certainly is another use case for it is cross-referencing with you know other credentials, network, you know properties and things like that to make sure that that is correct. Like you can't. You, we don't have a way to bind to arbitrary random things. You can bind right now to like pods or nodes, and it's only pods that would actually get this node information. So I think yes, for making further authorization decisions, um, certainly. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. So like uh, trampoline no uh, pods are like obviously the flashiest like example, but um, you're, there's always a chance that the um, node that an attacker gets is already has a trampoline node on it. So like beyond like scheduling, I mean disable scheduling to force every node, uh, every pod to be on you. Like, is, what are the other like security improvements we can realize with something like this? I, so I, I think for the trampoline node thing there, I would probably say you know using things like uh, taints tolerations and restricting who can use those is probably the first step I'd go for like further avoiding like any chance that you might just happen to be on that node already. Um, obviously, previously in this example, I think you know if you didn't if you didn't have uh, sorry if you didn't have taints and tolerations yet, you could totally land on that and do it. With that though, because you can now no longer laterally move to the next node, um, you kind of gain gain that already there. Um, yeah, so I, I think that this complements things like node pools and whatever else and like high secure nodes um, quite well. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you may have already suggested this, but is there any plan to have any of this kind of default into a sort of uh, admission, like the with the node authorizer, is there something where it could be packaged up? Do you expect that this will break certain uh, abuse in, in providers that may have misused the API? Or, or I, I guess the end question is, is this possible to get in to be a default in the end? Uh, so they actually had a good answer for that in the API missionary one. Uh, there is going to be future work um, around this, not specifically in the node authorizer because it's very specific to Kubelet. Yeah. But again, with this, there are a bunch of steps that like someone has to configure, right? And they have to get everything right. And for each component, which is not easy at all. So there is some work going to happen in the future around this. Uh, there are a couple of other caps that are in flight. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say watch out for that space. And, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I think the validated mission policy there is like quite quite dense and hard to read. Um, and I, I, I think this is kind of like the lowest common denominator uh, way to do it whilst we're still working out these patterns. So. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>